really any recovery situation, another reason to not want to get into it is not only is it a giant time suck from what you want to do, there are very few recovery situations that are perfectly safe. What is up, everybody? I have Jim across from me. That's right. Jim is our special guest today. We were just talking about that. You're like, oh, man, now I'm, I'm in the hot seat. Yeah. Yeah, it's really easy to sit on the side where you're the interviewer because nobody faults you for not knowing anything. That's the point. You're the interviewer. Yeah. So you just ask questions, dumb, smart, whatever. My job is not knowing. <sighs> yeah. Perfectly, no. <laughs> perfectly qualified. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> they said, who doesn't know the most? Put them on that side. Well, hey. You're good at at least figuring out what you don't know and asking good questions to know about it better. You've graduated. Only You've temporarily. Got- and I and and the topic of today I will say that I, I know a fair amount about, but actually the more I've researched in preparation for this podcast, the more I've realized, you know, a lot of times people in just about anything, you think that your knowledge is at a certain level. I didn't think that I knew everything. I knew I didn't, but I thought at least I knew a good bit. And then you like really dive deep into a topic and you start actually learning about it and not just watching whatever is the first YouTube video that pops up when you search it, but like learning about it, the physics and things in this case, especially physics. And and my bar of where I thought I was gradually went down and down. But I definitely, I, I feel like I know enough for this particular podcast and who we're speaking to and why we're speaking about it. So, yeah. And so, uh, before we get into the topic, if you're, lo- if you're watching, you can kind of see what the topic is. But what prompted this, Jim, Yeah, I got stuck the other day in my truck. Now, you and Ryan would blame my racing slick tires that I've been too cheap to change. But uh, I got stuck. I was out deer hunting. It was a... Uh, that was January, January, early January deer hunt. Mm-hmm. Um, very benign situation. Uh, a fair amount of snow on the ground. I pulled off to uh, hunt this piece of public that I've hunted a different part of it in the past, but I wanted to access it via this kind of other spot that I guess I hadn't before. Um, with the snow, like not... Like there's not a great pull off in general with hard ground, you know. So the snow that yeah. made it east, and then you kind of can't see also. So I, I pulled off. I uh, got on my truck, got all my stuff ready, went to hike back in. We'd also gotten uh, like some snow and rain. It's kind of a swampy area. Yeah. Uh, I walked about two feet off the road, broke through the snow, through the ice, and went over my. Uh, knee-high rubber boots like immediately like I was literally three feet off the road it became readily apparent that I was not going to access this piece of public the way I wanted to and the only way to access it like you'd had to walk through this you know it just wasn't going to happen you're like right this is like a fortress like some chest height waiters we're not getting no I wouldn't even done that Jim because I think I would have gotten stuck then I'd be dead you've been goner uh, I For me, got- though, you remember me when I first started hunting. I just wore chest high waders. <laughs> 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 Never know it, what I was going to get yeah, into. Live and learn. Um, yeah, if if I had, tr- I think if I'd tried to do that, like I, I wouldn't have gotten my truck stuck. Yeah, I just would have been. You'd, it'd have been a different story. Maybe a little bit more tragic, depending on who you are. Um, <laughs> so I get out. I'm like, well, I'll go hunt this other area that you know I can. I, I'm pretty sure I can get back into. Uh, went to pull off the road, which my truck was at just like, just a little bit of, I guess, uh, you know, an off angle. Camber. Yeah, off camber. Uh, went to pull out, and um, my, uh, the front end of my truck just like drew down into the ditch. It just pulled down into the ditch, which was full of snow. Like I said, it was a wet area to begin with. Uh, buried the front end. Yeah. And uh, it just like, I wasn't, I wasn't going to get out. And then I thought to myself, well, I'm not prepared for a situation like this at all. And I wasn't anticipating a situation like this. Like I said, I was basically pulling off a paved road. I know. It can happen that way. A lot of people, when they hear the idea of off-road recovery, their mind goes straight to something they've seen on a YouTube video or on TV of some, you know, Jeep that looks like a dune buggy, you know, and some guys 
basically just hammering it up some insane slope, mud everywhere, buried axles deep, you know, all this stuff. And then they got to just figure a way out of that. I mean, that certainly happens, but I think more often than not, people are getting stuck. You see it all the time around here in Wisconsin. People get stuck right off the side of the road. Cars whizzing by and you're just stuck five feet off of where everybody else is driving. Right, right. And it's not, uh, like you said, it's not something you go uh, looking for when, right. when when we're doing outdoor activities, like, like just hunting. That's generally when I'm outdoors. Or you could be going on a fishing adventure or, you know, wherever you're trying to get back into. Most often when I have gotten stuck, it's something where you kind of hit this questionable, questionable spot and you're like, well... I think I got, you know, I've got four-wheel drive. I've got, you know, maybe this. Like, I think I can get through that. And then you're like, hmm, interesting. I wasn't able to get through that. And you just wish you could, like, you know, back up the tape and have that knowledge. But, right. um They should actually you put, like, on the dial or on the shift lever for four-wheel drive, they should put in two-wheel instead of saying 2WD. It should say low confidence, and in 4WD, it should say <laughs> overconfidence because that's how so many people are. Especially now with modern cars that have all these modes you can switch into. Oh, well, I switched it into snow mode, so I can literally go to Antarctica if right. I wanted, you know. At 90 miles an hour. Yeah, with my all-season balding tires. <laughs> um, so, I went over... So, you asked me If to, you haven't gathered yet, by the way, this, this podcast is... It's a recovery gear pod... Like, kind of like a, a, basic, a basic recovery gear podcast theme. Yeah. And I kind of, I may divert from that, at least in, in the traditional sense of recovery, because I'm, I'm probably going to talk about a lot of stuff that has to do with just preparedness with your vehicle. And reco- recovery, in my mind, can mean a number of different things, because it's not always just being stuck. It could be fixing something that's broken, or it could be, um, it, it might not even be fixing something that's broken on your, on your vehicle, although we're going to try and stick to that. But, but having tools on hand as well is also a really nice thing to have. Uh, because you may need to fix something on your vehicle if you are stuck and you're using recovery gear and the recovery gear breaks or it's, you know, whatever, you're, you're trying to screw together a, a D-ring shackle and it's, it's corroded a little bit and you can't get at it with your fingers. You might want to p- a pliers to undo the bolt. I mean, whatever it is. Or you're trying to insert, I've got like a, a hitch recovery thing, you know, and you got to get the, uh, you got to get the pin out of your receiver in order to put that in. Um, you know, having tools on hand. Tools are great. Having the right tool for whatever job you're doing, pretty much anything on earth that involves manual labor, somebody's developed a tool to make the job easier. And some people may scoff at that because they're like, oh, well, I don't need to be easier. But usually, and this is what I wanted to point out a lot, is that when you are on a hunt, that's this is a hunting and shooting podcast. I don't think that's any surprise. But when you're on a hunt, in my mind, you don't want to get stuck. Don't find yourself in a recovery situation. Don't seek it out. Don't you know, uh, do anything that would very likely get you into that type of situation because usually people who are on a hunt, they've, they designated a certain amount of time. Maybe it's a week that they took off work. Maybe it's only a weekend. Maybe it's only a day or an afternoon, heck, that you can hunt. And that's what you're setting out to do. So like, remember what you're setting out to do and then try to avoid anything else that would keep you from doing the thing that you want to do. So, you know, I think that, uh, you know, a lot of what I'm referring to here, like if you want to go out and test the limits of what you can do off-road and then likely get stuck, but that's the fun thing, then by all means go for it. And you're probably going to want a number of different things than I've got here on the table. Uh, but this is all stuff that I feel is, is pretty good for somebody who's going out with the intention of not getting stuck and not getting themselves into anything stupid that would get them super duper stuck. Also, I this isn't normally how I pack it all. I kind of just threw together a lot of stuff here. Um, and there's a few things that aren't even on the table that we could go into. Like, I almost thought about bringing my winch, Mark, but winches are, that's, that's, they're fascinating. You, you, we were precasting and you were saying that, well, okay. It's also super heavy and really big and I just didn't want to take it up here. Fair enough. When I was texting you, like peppering you with questions after I got right. stuck, after I got out, uh, with the help of another individual, uh, luckily not a tow truck. Uh, which is what I thought I was going to have to do. Yeah. But also, I was um, in a spot where I didn't have cell reception. Yep. And so that was proving to be problematic uh, because I essentially didn't have comms. And again, I'm not like, I was kind of in the middle of nowhere, but not really at the same time. Um, my uh, Garmin InReach Mini, I was like trying out a uh, different bino harness. 
And so it was attached to my bino heart. Like I didn't swap it over. I just swap, swap the binos over. I'm like, I'm out here. I don't have my cell. And I always had, like, that's like, it's the only time this entire year that I haven't had it on me was then, of course. That right? in reach thing? Yeah. yeah. Um, even just to text my wife or, yeah. you know, whatever. Um, so anyway, I was peppering you with questions and I was getting down in a rabbit hole of like, what about this? What about this? What about this? What about this? And then precasting with you, it sounds like you kind of hit that a little bit, well, I guess in a different way with winches. It sounds like there's a lot more going on there than meets the eye. So many people who have winches attached to the front of their vehicle have no idea how they actually work. And and in a lot of ways have no business really messing with it because winches are extremely dangerous too. Like there's no there's no denying the fact that, that there's a, a legitimate danger there in using really any recovery situation. Another reason to not want to get into it is not only is it a giant time suck from what you want to do, there are very few recovery situations that are perfectly safe. It's it always involves some level of risk. Like you could get injured or dead, and I mean that doesn't even matter if you're on the side of the road, you could die because somebody might just not realize you're on the side of the road, which is an extremely common thing nowadays with so many people distracted while driving, and relying on their car's automated, you know, uh, driving assistance to to take care of things. But you know, I mean, people whizzing by you sixty five miles an hour. Sure, you might only have one wheel spinning or something like that, but don't take that lightly. Like, don't, it's not something to, to mess around with. No, but I think, like, also, like, yes, do, nobody, well, I guess, like, unless you're intentionally trying to get stuck, like, nobody wants to get stuck. But look, there's also situations that, you know, even the one that I was in, or you're like, oh, this looks fine. And then it, there's really not, very many signs pointing to like, oh, I'm going to get stuck here. And right. then all of a sudden you yeah. do like, I mean, okay. Yeah. I'll, case in point. I've got one case in point. I'll be the guy. Well, uh, one time, uh, but I was in the, uh, the old international gym and I think I was having an issue with, uh, the floats in my carburetor sticking. I was going up an incline and just kind of yeah, stopped yeah. and like wouldn't restart. And it was like a very, um, it was a dirt road. That was dry, and they kind of had like not pea gravel, but just like gravel. And so, like, I was trying to start the car, and then it wouldn't start. So I'm like, "Well, I'll just back down in neutral." But every time I would tap the brakes, the car, my the the uh, scout would like start to slide, and it hmm. got to a point where I'm like, "If I do this one more time, it's gonna go off the road and careening down like." But not sure. a good situation. No. We're going to lose the vehicle, possibly the passenger, me. And I did have a winch on there, and I brought it out, probably uh, not uh, using uh, proper safety protocol, but got it to a tree at the peak of the hill where it was uh, flattened out a little bit, winched myself up to the top, got her fired up, back to Love the it. thing. See, and that's the thing, too, is like there's all these precautions that you say, but then at the same time, you're going to have people who don't really have any idea what they're doing, and it works out just fine for them, too. So, like... I totally get that, but at the same time, you don't want to be the, the guy or gal who's like, oh, yeah, I mean, this will work just fine, and then all of a sudden you do find yourself at the uh, face end of a broken D-shackle heading at your face mm. at, you know, many, many, many miles an hour. You know what I mean? So, like, and these, and these things can go south so quick, too. You know, like, because the fact of the matter is people, you know, you're so used to cars, like, you, you don't really a lot of times give them the respect they're due, but in a recovery situation usually involves you getting out of the vehicle, right? And mm -hmm. so in essence, a lot of times you're on slippery conditions or something like that, and the vehicle may not be functioning the way that it's supposed to function, and you've gotten out of it, and you were the one in control of it, and now no one's in control of it. You know what I mean? So like, if you are in a slippery, slippery scenario, and oftentimes it's aided by gravity, that's part of the reason that you're stuck too, so you're on a slope. Well, how many people probably will walk behind or underneath, I'm thinking in terms of gravity, you know, like you're on the downward side of the vehicle, right? right? And nobody's in the car. And you're around fishing around, opening doors, moving stuff, rocking the car because you're trying to get things out, but you're on the downward side of the car. Like this is all stuff that can go south pretty quick. And a lot of people just don't think about it. And they don't realize that you got a truck, you got a thing that weighs four plus thousand pounds, just you know, waiting to maybe slide down, roll down, whatever. Do you have wheel chocks that you have in the truck with you? Because if you get out and you're stuck going uphill and you want to go around to the back of the truck where all your recovery gear is, did you, do you have wheel truck chucks underneath the tires so that you're preventing that car from popping out of park and rolling over you? 
I mean, this is all, it's all stuff you got to think about. So that like, I have kind of a list of things to just know. That's one of the most important things I think is just understanding the situation. And first off, you got to know your vehicle. So I have a couple, like a bullet pointed list of things that I think a lot of people probably, now if you are somewhat handy or whatever it is, maybe you change your own oil, you're one of those kind of people, you probably know these things, but it's, it's good stuff to realize when you're out and about. So like what attributes does your vehicle have? How much ground clearance do you have? Do you know? And in when it comes to ground clearance, a lot of times, you know, you may know of an arbitrary number that the manufacturer gave out. Like, oh yeah, my Subaru has nine inches of ground clearance. That's pretty good. It's more than a blankety blankety blank. Okay, what's the lowest part of the vehicle? What's the thing that hits first? Is it a control arm? which, you know, is fairly strong, but not infallible? Or is it your oil pan, which is aluminum and holding a very critical substance to your engine's functioning and you getting home? Or is it, you know, is it a transmission drain plug? I don't know what it is. It, it could be anything, but like what is the lowest point on your vehicle and how high off the ground is it? And also where is it located on the vehicle? You know, like, Control arms, yeah, they may be low on the car, and depending on what you're going over, you could hit those, but they're in line with the wheels. So as soon as your wheel is going up and over the thing, it's also pushing the control arm up and over the obstacle. But if your lowest point is right dead center in the middle of the car, then, you know, if you start high centering over something, your wheels have made it over, you know, and so you got up and over the obstacle, but then the center of your vehicle, because the rear tires are still on the downward side of it, and your front tires are now up and over on the other downward side of it, the center of that vehicle may start scraping along, and then you could hit something. That's, that's what important. that sound is. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> do you have underbody protection on your vehicle? So, do you have a skid plate that's protecting the oil pan? Do you have a skid plate that's protecting your fuel tank? One that's protecting your differential? Do you have one that's protecting your transmission? You know, you might have all those things, some or more. You might just have one. Uh, and you know. Like, what are your approach and depart uh, approach and departure angles of the vehicle? So, if you have a severe uphill area that you're going to, or a bump, or even if it's just a log that's down, like, and you want to get up and over that, or just start going uphill, you know, can you actually make that without scraping the whole front part of your bumper off? You know, that if you're in an emergency situation, you may not care about the plastic bumper that's on the front of your car, but how low is the radiator? hanging down, you know, behind that bumper. Like, there's important stuff usually behind that. Um, you know, of course, things like, well, Mark, what's your, how are your tires? I know you need, you, you need some new tires. Every time, I got to say, your, your Tundra is a nice looking truck. I think it looks sporty. Black truck, black wheels. Normally, I'm not all about the murdered outlook, but your truck looks good. So, a lot of times, I'll be driving through the parking lot, and I'll see that, and I'm like, oh, that's a nice Tundra. And then I'm like, wait a minute, it's Mark's. The tires are all wrong. It's they, it's nearly criminal. The tires just, they actually kind of, not even just for functionality, they kind of ruin the look. Yeah, 100%. So, like... It's like, it's, I love, I've really been enjoying that truck. Yeah. But even every time I get into it, I look at the tires and I'm like, Ugh. It's just... Just got to pull that trigger, man. I know. Um, and we'll get into some of the good upgrades that you can do for this type of thing. But I mean, tires may have saved you in the first place in that ish in that in instance that you found yourself in. I don't know for sure because I don't know what it looked like, but they could have been a huge help to you. It could have been the difference between that initial pull down in. Like yeah. it might have been able to grab enough that you just pop out, and we're not even right having this conversation at least for what prompted this conversation right yeah understand what your tires are good in what they're designed for do you have mud terrain tires you know and those are going to be good in some instances not good in others do you have snow tires which are you know going to be good at some things not good at others all terrains are usually pretty good in a lot of things but still there's going to be some limitations like if you haven't actually taken your particular tires wheeling before off road look up some of the legitimate non-paid for reviews of those tires online and you can see kind of what people a lot, of, a lot of people will put them to really good tests almost every tire out there especially off-road tires will have like really hardcore tests people put them through and it's i enjoy reading those um you know and then of course general center of gravity i think is important too because if you are getting super off camber you want to know like what you can get away with without your car tipping over you know that was a big thing with the old jeep wranglers they used to be pretty top heavy and so you know people would you worry about flipping them and stuff like that, you know, is a more top heavy vehicle. Um, you know, but maybe a different vehicle is also top heavy, or maybe that's not something you have to worry about. But these are all just like know your vehicle is what I'm getting at. Yeah. Um, where is it heavy? 
So trucks, a lot of people using those things, light in the back. And you get used to driving it one way. Maybe, though, when you go on your hunt, it's pretty loaded down in the back. It's going to behave differently if it's loaded down in the back than it does when it's completely empty in the back. You know, so understanding the dynamics of your vehicle, how the weight's going to transfer, and, you know, where that's going to matter if you're off-road. Uh, heavier in the back isn't always better. Like, a just a generally super-duper heavy vehicle isn't always great in certain situations off-road. Um, you know, but, like, you're going to have a tough time getting good traction in the rear if you have a super, super lightweight rear end. Uh, I have to deal with that in my little Toyota truck. I put that aluminum flatbed on it, which is oh. a very light. I made that thing, and yeah. so it's super light in the back. So I have to load it down, or else the back wheels just skip on any sort of loose traction because there's not enough pushing down into them to actually like get them to bite. They're just kind of like real easy to spin. But I guess like also for when you have it in use of a heavy load, that's probably perfect. For yeah, that too. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. Um, what wheels are driven? How are they driven? That's really important. Like, so you were talking about you got four wheel drive, right? Yeah, it says right on it. Yeah. So knowing how four wheel drive works, that's important. Four wheel drive. A lot of people think, okay, yeah, I'm sending power to all four wheels. You're sending power to the front and the rear. But if you have open differentials front and rear, then they're still going to figure out what they want to do with the power, and it's not necessarily going to go to all four wheels equally. So a four-wheel drive, like a true four-wheel drive, is a transfer case that's going to lock the power output between the front and the rear. So the front and the rear will spin at the same rate. They are locked together. But the left and the right can still spin independently of one another. And so what you had, I'm guessing you were driving you know, on the right side of the road. You pulled off on the right side of the road. So it was your passenger side that was off and the slippery stuff. Yep. The left side of your car, the driver's side, probably was on grippy stuff, or at least grippy enough to get you out of there. Mm-hmm. But if you have grip on one side of your vehicle and you don't on the other, your differential will always send the power to whatever pathway has the least resistance. So you were just spinning your wheels that were in the slippery stuff, your passenger side wheels. Mm -hmm. Those were the things that were spinning. And as they were spinning, they were kicking out a bunch of snow that was packed underneath them, Mm -hmm. which then caused a more of a void on your passenger side for your whole truck to slip down into. Were you there? No, but I just, that's how it, (laughs) that's how it, that's how it happens. And so a lot of people are like, oh, I'm in four wheel drive, but you don't realize that you only have two wheels spinning. And the two wheels that are spinning are not the ones you want spinning because they don't have any grip. Right. And so like, do you realize that, you know, so, so think about that before you get your truck into a certain situation where you're only going to have grip on one side and not on the other side in order for, for an open differential four wheel drive system or all wheel drive system to work. You need to have both wheels on the ground with at least some sort of traction uh, or else you're just going to be doing a one-tire fire. Uh, That's where that phrase comes from. Same deal with all-wheel drive, though. All-wheel drive, like you're relying on a a differential in the center Mm -hmm. to distribute power front and rear. So you're not necessarily locked front and rear like you are in four-wheel drive where the front and the rear have to be spinning at the same rate. Uh, You can have differentials there. So an all-wheel drive can start to kind of differentiate the power that it sends to each wheel. And then are you aware of how it differentiates that? Some all-wheel drive cars, people are like, it's all-wheel drive. It says so on the trunk, you know? It says AWD. Mm-hmm. That might just mean that it's a really front-wheel drive-based or focused all-wheel drive system. So essentially, you're driving a front-wheel drive car, and if the vehicle detects slip in the, you know, in the front or just overall some sort of slip occurring, it'll send some power to the rear. But it might only be 30% of the power. Or you might have, you know, in this case of the Subaru, it can do it. It has the 50-50 symmetrical all-wheel drive system. That's a really good all-wheel drive system. Better off-road than, you know, your standard Honda CRVs and you know Toyota Rav4s and stuff like that. Those are pretty pretty standard front-wheel drive based all-wheel drive systems. Um, what kind of t- traction devices do you have at your disposal? So traction devices are stuff that's built within the car. Okay, so. Usually, traction devices, like I'm referring to, are designed to mitigate what I was just talking about. Your differential is only sending power to the wheel with least resistance, and therefore, the one that's slipping, and therefore, you're stuck. Do you have some sort of traction control? Traction control is kind of lame, but sometimes can work when you're off-road. It basically applies the brakes to wheels independently in order to give more resistance to the wheel that's spinning. So if you have, 
say your right wheel is off and it's spinning freely because it's on slick surface, your left wheel is on perfectly dry, grippy stuff. If you have traction control, a good traction control, it will apply the brakes slightly to the right wheel that's spinning in order to give a little bit more resistance there while you're pushing the gas. And that will hopefully cause the differential to send some power to the left side, which will then get you out. That's okay. not a great thing to rely on because you're relying on a computer that really wasn't usually designed to actually help you off-road. Usually it's designed to help you on-road in slippery conditions and stuff like that. And oftentimes it's kind of an annoying nanny that you gets in your way. So I wouldn't rely on traction control unless, you know, it's super off-road oriented. Like the Tacomas with their, you know, off-road modes and stuff like that. Ryan is always talking about how he can switch little flips and levers up there. I'm pretty certain the way that they're doing that is really just modulating brakes as you're going off-road. And it's modulating the brakes and it's sending power to, you know, basically different wheels by using the brakes. Uh, hmm. Which is going to heat up your brakes, too. Like, you might not actually have gone that far and your foot may, it may have never actually touched the brakes, but your brakes get pretty hot. And then after you get out of a really messy situation, your brakes are super hot because you've been fighting against them, against the power of the accelerator. Uh, and then you get out and you're like, whew, that was a doozy. And then you have your foot sitting on the brake for a long time. You might start to warp your brake rotors. Um, but anyway, that's that. Do you have a limited slip differential? So a limited slip is also going to kind of have a little bit of a mind of its own, but it's going to use a clutch pack or some sort of other mechanism in the differential to kind of lock up that slipping wheel. But then you rely on it to be functioning on its own. And you also, it's not going to ever lock up 100% like a locker would, like an e-locker or an air locker. Usually air lockers are aftermarket. Most cars that come with it or have e-lockers. Like, it will lock the two sides together. So they have to spin at the same rate. Okay. And then usually you use that at low speeds, but it'll help you kind of use whatever side has actual traction to get you out of it. So, you know, these are all things, you know, know your vehicle. That was kind of, it was a long bullet-pointed list. But so many people don't know these things. They Jim, I don't. I didn't have the answers to any of those questions. I look, I'm not a car guy, though. I know. I know. Well, and that's fine. Because, I mean, there's so many different things in this world for people to get into. If everybody was into cars, like, there wouldn't be as many other hobbies. Like, a lot of other hobbies couldn't exist. This is, this, Jim, and also, I'd be know, really I, annoyed because everybody would probably be buying up all the cool cars. And, you yeah. know what I mean? And that's already kind of happening because all the cool cars are old and... If I was into cars as much as you, then I wouldn't take the time to go hunt and then get stuck and then ask you car questions. Yeah, and I wouldn't get that enjoyment. I um, think what I was also saying is kind of similar to like when people are like, hey, we need more hunters, and then they get really annoyed when there's more hunters. <laughs> 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 that never happens. We need more, we, just not not where I go. Yeah. Um, okay, you said a couple things there, and I think this does play into not getting stuck because one thing in Correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm saying this wrong, but you were like, with my truck, I could like add like a locking diff mm -hmm. or something like that. So, and I think you covered like what it's doing there, but I, I was like, oh, like that's actually like almost like pre putting on recovery gear. Yeah. So a lot of ways people get stuck are, are what I would call traction stucks, like traction yeah. related. Yeah. You know, and usually it's pretty benign, like yours seemed at first. And at then it first. gets it gets worse because people don't know how to deal with it. And then they sort of make it worse by spinning tires, digging themselves in further, and then you get up to the axles. And at that point, then it requires serious recovery. So if you can avoid those serious recoveries in the first place, you're definitely in a good spot. So like I got to a point where I was like, well, just add throttle. Yeah, and you made it worse. Yes. So, um, tires are the biggest thing. We've talked about that already. We did a whole podcast with Rob Morrell on, on off-road tires and stuff. I, I actually really like that podcast a ton, not just, I guess, because I was in it and because I'm a car guy, but I thought that was a really useful podcast going over some of the details there, um, in terms of what's going to be good for somebody who is going hunting and stuff like that. Um, and so tires are huge because they're the only connection points between all of Everything about your vehicle, everything that's in it, everything you intend to do with it, like everything about your vehicle is dependent upon four little contact patches between it and the ground. So if you can improve those contact patches by means of getting better grip through better tires, do it by all means. It's the most important upgrade you can ever do to any car. It doesn't matter if it's an off-road vehicle or if it's a race car. 
sports car, you know, just your regular everyday average ordinary daily driver, making sure you have the right tires is paramount and too many people ignore it. So the other one would be some form of a differential lockup, right? That would avoid the one tire fire. And that could be installing a limited slip if your vehicle doesn't already have a limited slip. But in order to install anything into the driveline, like into the differential of your vehicle, it's going to be fairly costly. So if you're going to go all the way to installing, you know, like a limited slip, you may want to consider just doing the locker to begin with. Limited slips can be really nice on road. Like if, when you're on the pavement and you encounter little slippery situations now and then, they can be really nice. So that is kind of a benefit to them. However, when we're talking about straight up off-road stuff, no one's going to deny the fact that the ultimate off-road solution to avoid getting stuck or to get over or through obstacles is a, a true locker. So, and then if you have that locker put in, is that something where, like, how do you engage that? Is Does that auto-engage when it's like, we need this? Or do no. you like, nope, we're in a little bit of a hairy spot? No, it, it wouldn't. Um, so, first off, check to make sure your car doesn't actually already have one. Usually it's characterized by, there's the four-wheel drive symbol that shows, um, you know, two rear wheels that are both facing straight and then two front wheels, and they characterize the front wheels by turning, you know, because mm-hmm. it shows, obviously, your most cars, your rear wheels don't turn unless you have one of the sweet GM quadra steers. I hate to say it because it's a GM product, but they are cool. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, so your... Uh, there's a little axle between the two rear wheels. And if there's a little X in the axle, that's that implies that you already have a rear locker. Normally, it's going to be in the rear. Most cars, aside from like Jeep Rubicons and the new Ford Bronco, like high-end pack, off-road packages, most, most cars don't have a front and a rear locker. They'll usually, if they do come with a locker at all, they'll come with a rear. So like the Tacoma TRD off-roads, I know the Nissan Xterra and the uh, Frontier uh, Pro 4X, I don't know if they still call them the Pro 4X. Ford F-150s with the FX4 package, mm. uh, I know can have them at least. So stuff like this. Usually usually vehicles with off-road packages can oftentimes come with an, an e-locker. But if you install one aftermarket, they're going to install a switch on your dash. So okay. you'll want to come to a stop. Don't engage a locker while you're going. In fact, on those factory options, they usually won't even let you. And sometimes they'll even require you to be in the four low just because they don't want you to go fast with a with a locker. Because your, your differential, it does that annoying when you're stuck thing where it sends power to the path of least resistance. It does that on the road to avoid grenading your differential. You know, And like if you've ever had a super lucky uppy LSD, uh, and you've been trying to just like park in a parking lot, you'll feel it engaging a bunch. Or if you've ever been oh. in four wheel drive and it's dry out and you have your front and rear locked together with a transfer case and you're lurching a bunch as you'd make tight turns, like that's that's what you get. That's why you don't want to always have it on. But um, yeah, you'd, you'd activate it with a switch. And if you got an air locker, which I know ARB does, and they're supposedly really cool and a lot of the Aussies really love them, and I trust anything an Aussie says pretty much about off road recovery or anything. Um, but they love those things, but then you have to get an air compressor. You have to mount that somewhere. You have to route all the airlines back to your diff. Then you have to route a switch up to your air compressor. And then, you know, so you have to do all these things. There's multiple points going on. Whereas if you do an e locker, you can just install the diff, the e locker, you can basically wire it up to your dash and you just flip it on. It does its thing. Very interesting. So back those. In, back in the day, Jim. Yeah. And I don't think really cars have this anymore, but the, like my International, I remember my dad's uh, 88 F250, I believe. We had locking hubs on the front end. So Yeah, so what you're doing there is you're just engaging the front for the four-wheel drive. So the transfer case is going to get locked into place, so that way your power output that was only going to the rear wheels mm-hmm. is now locked in place and it's sending power up front, okay? And it's going to go out via uh, you know axle shafts out to your hubs. Now, your hubs are normally freewheeling, and so you would unlock them when you're not in four-wheel mm-hmm. drive because you just don't really need to have the resistance of your hubs and everything engaged while you're driving in two-wheel drive, especially if they don't have a purpose. And so, in those old cars, they didn't have electronic locking hubs. Nowadays, you just go and you push four-wheel drive, there's an electronic mechanism that locks the hubs to those axle shafts. So, the same thing's happening, just different, or uh, happening via electronics I wouldn't, versus uh, manual. No? <laughs> Yeah, the same thing's happening with an electronic four-wheel drive push and engage. 
But just note that you're only locking the axle shafts to the outer hubs. So that way, four-wheel drive is actually like powering your wheels and tires up front. You're not locking the differential. Right. So mm-hmm. that's, that's an important distinction. But I think things like that, and then also carrying a set of go-treads with you. Um, I have these. They're in this, uh, in this bag here. They're kind of an interesting invention. These are the alternative to what you see a lot of kind of like, oh, flat brim wearing dudes Gem, and forerunners. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, you see, no, and mine are, I'm, I'm going to say this as my go trids are actually perfectly clean. I had to just get a new set. And, uh, and so I haven't used these ones yet, but I do have them on hand just in case. So basically what these devices do and what those, I was kind of making a joke. Whenever you see somebody driving around, they got a big orange, like mini surfboard looking thing with spikes all over it. Traction boards. A lot of times people are using the max tracks. That's the brand name. Basically what these are designed to do is to be put under your tire. The one that doesn't have any grip or really even just both tires on a, a front or back. So, like, if you put them under both your rear tires, for example, if you're really dug in, then the idea is that they sort of wedge themselves uh, into the ground and get kind of planted into the ground. Mm -hmm. And then they, on the other side, have this also really grippy surface for your tires to actually get a purchase on. And so then you can use them to get out of a sticky situation. And usually when you're stuck, you're only stuck about, say, you know, two feet if you will, or, or not that much. Like it, it usually only takes a little bit of momentum and maybe only, you know, the distance that these go treads cover is, I don't know, I guess a little over a yard probably. Usually it only takes that much distance for you to finally get the, the vehicle to have enough momentum to get going in whatever direction you want to get going. So something like this or a traction board works. Did you get the, uh, I was looking at those the other day. Did you get the longies? I got the XLs. Yeah. Um, and I think the, the reason I like the go treads is just because they pack down into this little bag. Whereas when you have the traction boards, um, you have to find a spot for them inside and they're going to take up space. Granted, not like a ton of space, but you, you probably are going to want two traction boards. You may even want four and then that's a lot of space. And, you know, or you slap them on the outside of your rig and then they're bright orange, even if they're black. Like everyone knows what those are and that they're kind of, you know, nice objects and if they're just right out there on the outside of your vehicle, like it's not surprising at all to me if they get stolen. So these kind of pack down real nice and small. And you basically just, yeah, you just shove them under your tires in the direction you want to go. And your tires kind of gobble them up when they use them, but you get that immediate grip and enough to usually just pop you out of the situation. Mm-hmm. So just when you say gobble them up, like not. Oh, they're reusable when you're done. Yeah. But I mean, they're, they're not. I mean, it looks funny when you use them. You think that you're destroying them. Okay. But like the whole point is you're going to get your wheel spinning. And then as soon as your wheel catches that go tread, like it's going to get brought underneath the wheel very quickly. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And then once it gets brought under the wheel, it's going to jam itself into the ground. It's going to find a purchase somewhere. And then when that happens, your wheel can grip onto the go tread and kind of launch itself out of the situation. Yep. Um, I and nearly so guarantee, like there's so many things that would have gotten me out of this it really was like a little jam, right? Yeah. Like it could have been so simple, but like locking diff probably would have gotten it. Uh, the, just even better tires alone probably would have got it. Right. And these things, I nearly guarantee sands like those two things when I initially got going at least. Yeah. And even maybe once the car was completely, like, I mean, my front end was like buried, dude. It was like bad. There was a lot of wet snow there. Um, dude, I think they would have done it. They could, yeah, they very well could have. And this, the nice thing about these things that I've just brought up are that these are items where, you know, having good tires, having a button to push on your dash that locks your differential, and having the ability to just stick some go treads underneath your vehicle, maybe have a shovel to shovel it out a little bit to get a better, you know, surface for them to go on top of. These are all like quick recovery solutions. Mm-hmm. They're much quicker than trying to hook up a winch. They're much quicker than having to flag down someone else, get all hooked up to their rig, trying do so in a relatively safely manner, have them pull you out. Like that's all stuff that's now taking a ton of time. So these are all kind of quick tries. And again, like if you know the situation too, you can, you can preemptively avoid something like you ended up in. Not that, you know, I mean, it happens to all of us, but like maybe if you get in the vehicle and you're like, Hey, I can tell I'm off camber here. I know it's super slippery over there on my right side. So I know my right, my passenger side wheels and tires are not going to have a lot of grip. I'm just going to lock the diff right away just to get out of this spot. Before I even bother yeah. with trying to hammer on it and I slide down. Now I'm creating issues 
that make it harder on my recovery gear to get me out. You know what I mean? So like if you can preemptively foresee uh, a situation like that, and you know that that goes into even just when you're on the road, right? Like paying attention to the road and just looking at the road ahead of you, understanding like that that road looks slick right there. I can tell that the rest of the road has a dullness to it, and that ro- part of the road right there looks really dark and flat and almost has like a satin finish to it. That's black ice, you know. So I know as soon as the passenger side of my car hits that black ice, like I might have low traction on my right side. So either I can avoid it, or I can just be prepared and like kind of know what I want to do ahead of time with the steering wheel when I lose some traction right away on the right side and then I regain it suddenly after I go over the black ice. Like this So I take it out of cruise control? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> that might be one thing you could do. Uh, but I, I think that having the ability to actually understand what physics are will occur if you do something a certain way is really important. That's I guess I've gone to some driving schools and, and one of the coolest things about doing that is is being able to push a vehicle to its limits. I know that here in Wisconsin, we have a lot of hooligan kids who go out when it snows and they go to empty parking lots at night and do donuts. But honestly, if I was a if I was a cop, I can't say this for certain. I don't know if I would. But as long as they weren't being like really disruptive and putting other people's lives or vehicles or property in, in jeopardy, if it was like a truly wide open parking lot, I might let it happen because they're probably learning more about vehicle control and learning what happens when a vehicle is slipping and when you I know, turn like this, when I'm going like when this, I turn when like I'm like this and this gun much it, my yeah. back end's breaking loose or whatever. Yeah, like if that happens, like that's really good. I used to do that all the time in high school, admittedly, and I learned so much about how a car works. Like you learn about understeer and I mean, this is all stuff now we're getting out of out of recovery, but but like learn what no, will we're happen. Getting out of, we're getting out of recovery and, and encouraging it. our youth to. Uh, yeah, we're I don't not. Know. Do it we're in not. A, I don't know. Do it in a Do safe not, way. Or go to a, you know, go to a race. Like learn to uh, learn to take a class. Take a class. Something like that. Uh, it's it's invaluable. Understanding weight transfer of your vehicle and and you know all that stuff. Invaluable. Can I ask? Because I'm really like I will own some of these. Um, does the articu- like the articulation like allows them to be compact? They fit in that cool little case, right? Yeah. Um, but does that also like help with so the the um, way that these like I guess the contour of like maybe uneven yeah. ground or something. Yeah, because the way that the go treads work, you want them to get sucked under your tire, and then you want them to when they do that, they get jammed into the ground, and your tire ends up on top of them, and you get grip to go out. Mm-hmm. Right, that's how they function. Whereas traction boards, you stick them in the way in the orientation that you want your vehicle to go, and mm-hmm. then you, all you have to do is get your wheels or your tires. I always use wheels and tires interchangeably, but I technically it's tires. You want to get your tires up onto the traction board, and then basically the traction board is going to remain in place, and you'll use the grip from the traction board to crawl out, Okay. and then it's going to get you out of that spot and onto better ground. Um, I think traction boards work phenomenally. There's no, there's no doubting that. The other nice thing about traction boards, if you park your vehicle on soft surface and you're going to camp in it or just have it parked there overnight, you can park it up on top oh. of traction boards, and they're going to spread the weight like snowshoes for your car. Yeah. You can do that with go treads a little bit. Like I know you can kind of put them out in a certain way and you can park on top of them. It'll disperse the load a little bit, but not nearly as much as a full-size traction board. Okay. And that is that's a nice thing because then when you wake up in the morning, you're not w- waking up with a car that's sunk in. Mm-hmm. You know, or what happens with snow all the time is your tires are hot from driving on the road so much, and then you get to a spot off-road to like park your car, and then basically you've melted down a little tire-shaped ice pocket that your tires are in. And if it's deep enough, you can just get stuck. You literally turn on your car and you're just stuck in, on like flat ground even. You're just stuck. And so that's a situation where having a shovel on hand, shoveling out some of that snow, getting a set of go treads or a traction mm-hmm. board underneath will just get you out and it'll get you going again. All you had to do is get out of that little melted ice pocket that you created. For Same. sure. And like there's things like you can do things like we're talking about, oh, avoidance is like probably the best thing in some, or in, in most cases, uh, if not all. But also... You, like you said, you could be camped somewhere. It could be perfectly dry. Well, now a rainstorm came in. Well, that could create some sloppy conditions. Oh, a snowstorm came in. Well, now we've got snow. You know, so yeah, you can't, you know, it's the weather, right? It is. It is. So the reason I kind of point these things out, like I said, so I I like the idea of not having to get out and use a winch, use recovery straps, use another vehicle to have to pull me out. I like the idea of that because- Step one. So step one, like these are all traction stuck things. You know what I mean? 
Now, granted, some people are going to be like, okay, yeah, it's easy to say, you know, like get a locking differential. They're not expensive. They're usually going to cost you four figures, probably like anywhere from a thousand to two thousand bucks for the differential. Installation is going to be expensive because you are dealing with drivetrain components. You have to probably find a somewhat semi specialty four wheel drive shop. There's a lot of those around. I think people don't realize oftentimes how many shops there are that kind of, at least even if it's an automotive shop that has a four-wheel drive enthusiast who's one of the technicians. So definitely look around. It's going to be an expensive installation. Okay. And then you got to, go treads really aren't too bad. I think, you know, it's about a hundred bucks shipped to your house or something like that. New tires can be expensive nowadays. They are getting more and more pricey. But if you look at the money that you spend there, you can avoid so many situations where you're going to get stuck stuck with good tires, uh, some sort of means of, of traction you know, control, preferably locking diff, in, in my opinion, something like this. For that amount of money, you can avoid a lot of situations versus investing the same amount of money in a bunch of recovery gear that'll get you out of situations maybe you could have avoided in the first place, right? Right. So let's talk about getting a winch, Okay. Getting a winch to do self-recovery with your vehicle, uh, a winch is definitely a couple hundred bucks. They're not super cheap. You can get off-brand ones, and then you're just kind of dealing with, you know, you always risk it a little bit, but they're not going to be cheap. If you get a worn winch, generally really nice, those are probably going to cost you nearly four figures, if not into the thousands of dollars. Um, Smitty Built is a pretty good brand. Usually, uh, they have good stuff that you can buy for a little bit less expensive. But you got to get a means to mount it. To your vehicle, so you probably are going to be investing in a winch bumper of some sort, right? So that's not going to be cheap. That's going to probably cost you over a grand, and you're going to have to have somebody help you install it. Probably, if you can do it yourself, that works great. But usually, they're pretty dang heavy, and you have to line them up with the frame and all this other stuff. Get all the bolts. I mean, it's you're going to at least want a buddy or two to help you out if you do it yourself. But certainly, uh, it may be helpful to have a shop do it for you. And if you're doing a modern car, it may require cutting of the plastic bumpers. It may require relocating of the sensors that you have, the parking sensors, or even these modern cars now with the sonar systems on the front for the uh, lane keeping and, and collision avoidance and all that. So you're talking about a lot of stuff there. And then you also have to get all the winch accessories. So you got to get all your winch line. You got to get a tree saver, because if you're ever going to save yourself off of a tree, you don't want to kill the tree by doing it. It's not like... Getting your truck out, when you had cell reception, you could have just called a tow. It's not worth you killing a 250-year-old oak tree. You know what I mean? I don't, like, I suppose unless you were in some super-duper emergency. In that case, I get it. But like, just have a tree saver. Uh, you're going to need to get some D-rings and shackles. You're probably going to want to get some soft shackles. You're going to want to uh, get a winch extension line. You're going to want to get a winch line uh, weight, whatever they call those things. You oh, drape like it over the, the winch. Blanket? Yeah, you drape it over the winch line. Now, granted, you can use other things to improve in sort of an improv improvisation. But there's a lot of stuff you want to get. And then you have to realize that using a winch is a slow process. Like, it's something that you really want to plan out before you do it. I get, like, so you and the scout, you just, like, hooked it up to something, you pulled yourself out. Like, that happens a lot of times. But I think a lot of people don't fully realize that when it does happen and it works out that way, like, you're pretty lucky, you know? Or at least maybe you weren't super stuck and you were in a type of stuck that maybe you could have gotten out with uh, with another type of device like a locker and some go treads in the first place, you know? But if you're like really, really, really stuck, it usually takes a fair amount of planning and it's not a safe process. You have a ton, a ton of energy stored in that winch cable. And, you know, if you have a winch controller that requires you to be next to the winch in order to control it, it's not wireless, then you're going to have to be outside the vehicle and you're going to have to be kind of kind of close to it. Usually they make the cords long enough that you can get away, but still like tons of energy stored up and you know, like, or you might get in the vehicle, which isn't a bad idea, but even still, if you're in the vehicle and you have a D ring on the tree side or your anchor side break, it could come flying back into your windshield. Like there's a lot of, I saw it in my research, a lot of pictures of like full size rigs with D rings just, and, and a winch line still attached to it, just sent through the windshield. Like it's not something I want to be. I, unless I go out with the with the thought process, and I've got probably buddies with me in their rigs, and I'm like, hey, we're gonna go out, we're gonna test the limits, we're gonna try and get stuck. Let's just see. We want to test out all this winch equipment. That's awesome. But even still, when those guys do it, they're exercising a lot of precautions so as not to literally get themselves like shredded in half or like decapitated. Yeah, I mean nobody likes that, right? But <laughs> you can't like. 
I don't think I don't think you're saying that you're anti winch. No, it's just like no. there's a lot to consider. There's a lot to consider, and I'm mostly saying this as a precaution because I think a lot of people think a winch is like this. It's it's like this super pill. You know, if I put it on my car, I'm done. You know, like oh, I I got a winch. It's on my car. There's a hook on the end of the winch line. I'm done. I can get out of anything, and that's not the case. Like it's there's just a lot to it. You know, and then you know there's a lot to like buying a winch in general. Like, do you know how much your car weighs? Do you know how much your Tundra weighs, for example? I'm not calling you out for it. I actually couldn't tell you the car that I drove in today. I couldn't tell you off the top of my head what I think weighs. if I was buying a winch, though, like I'd look at the rating and go, well, I better go figure out how much my <laughs> truck weighs. Yeah, yeah, because they're, they're rated. And a lot of times people don't realize, like, okay, so you have a 4,000-pound Jeep. You know, so they're like, oh, well, the 5,000-pound winch should get me out. I got 1,000 a, a pounds of wiggle room there. Well, you don't realize that that's just the weight of your Jeep. You also have to consider the amount of force it's going to take to get 4,000-pound Jeep unstuck, which is going to be considerably more than 4,000 pounds and probably more than 5,000 pounds. So a lot, like a really popular weight for winches is 9,500 pounds. Then there's 10,000-pound winches. There's 12,000-pound winches or 12,500-pound winches, and you can go up from there. But you definitely want to get something that's going to be, usually the, the rule of thumb is like weight and a half of your vehicle. And even then, you may not have enough oomph to get your winch out. Well, then you might want to have pulleys on hand so that you can give yourself, uh, you know, like a, a snatch block up at the tree, run the, the winch line through the snatch block, come back to a recovery point on your truck, and then you've actually halved the amount of weight that your winch is essentially required to pull. Like I, there's, I get a pulley. What's a snatch block? It's, it's a pulley. Oh, okay. A snatch block is basically a pulley that you can attach to an anchor point and then, and then run your winch line through. Okay. Kind of designed for off-roading and stuff. Okay. Um, but yeah, then you get into the world of pulleys, and I was really going down that rabbit trail, and that was wild. You know, like all the ways that you can get mechanical advantage with your winch, all the ways you can do anchor points, but then you need to like get all these winch extension lines and you know extra anchor points to anchor to trees, more tree savers, like all this stuff. It gets it gets pretty wild. And of course, you have to rely on having good anchors around. You know. Right. So. If we were in Arizona and we got stuck, remember, and, you know, with the Sub, and we had a winch on our vehicle, which we didn't, but if we did, what would we have attached to? We're not attaching to Ocotillo. That's not going to pull a Subaru out of a, out of a no. you know, wet, sandy, muddy, whatever that was there in Arizona. It's not going to do that. Like, we probably would have had to dig a giant hole and put a counterweight down in the hole and then attach our winch to the, like, we'd have been there forever. Right. So you got to kind of rely on that. You know, do you have enough, enough winch line to actually get to some sort of an anchor point? Are there anchor points around? Are they strong enough to pull you out? Um, you know, you got to be inspecting your winch line, making sure it's not fraying, going to like, going to snap on you and then, mm. you know, potentially cause you harm. I mean, yeah, it's... Seems like a lot of those modern winch lines are that am steel now. Is that what that is? I see a lot of synthetic. Like I don't know. I see a lot of synthetic lines. Don't quote me. They don't call them like spider, spidera or something like that. And, uh, well, then there's obviously the old classic steel cable, but then you really want to make sure you're wearing gloves if you're dealing with that stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, but uh, winches are a whole thing. I actually, there's a, and I brought it, uh, up here because I wanted to mention it. I was watching, in terms of, like, understanding how winches work, the physics behind them and the mathematics involved, I think it's, it's really important if you're going to get one. Check out L2S. F-B-C. I think he's an Australian dude. And he's got some great science on his YouTube channel about how all that stuff works and, you know, different ways you can rig up your vehicle. It, it I th- Like a lot of search and rescue, you know, fire uh, or rock climbing people, they use all these, you know, it's, it's all ropes and stuff, right? Rigging is right. what it is. And so... There's a lot of interesting ways to give yourself mechanical advantage and, and find ways to get yourself out. There's even a way, Mark... Two, with a front-mounted winch, pull yourself backwards. And it doesn't involve running the line under your car. It You go up to a snatch block right in front of you. You go to a snatch block to your side. You go to a snatch block behind you. You go to a snatch block on your rig at the back. And then you go to another anchor point behind you, directly behind you. And you so can, you need a lot of anchor points to do this. And though. snatch blocks and everything. You need all the stuff. And you need a lot of winch line. I mean, it is interesting that it's even possible. It um, is. That's one but thing that I was going to bring up is truck. You know, oftentimes a winch is mounted to the front. Now they make ones that you can like, you know, like kind of I guess the receiver hitch mounted one where you can like move it from the front to the rear. I think something like that. And yeah. in the in a lot of cases, you know, just kind of you and I talking, it's like, hmm, actually, 
a lot of the times the way out is it's just a it's a simple matter. Of, hmm, I wish I did. I wish I, I wish did I do that. Go where I went. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't need to get that far. Mm-hmm. I just need to go back out the way I came and then reconsider my options. Reassess. Yeah. So that's where I actually had a truck once with a rear mounted winch, and I used it primarily for pulling stuff up onto trailers, uh, cars. But um, you know, I think I think. Having one of those winches, though, that's on the receiver thing that you can put into your your receiver hitch, I'm not sure about. I actually have one, okay, and I but I haven't used it because I. It's a really cool idea in concept because you're like, oh, I can put the winch front back, don't matter. It but, makes so much sense. Okay, winches are heavy. And when you connect them to the cradle that they have to be used to mount into your hitch, they get even heavier. Like, over 100 pounds. And when you're stuck in the mud or the snow, it's not exactly even surface, usually. If you're stuck in it, it's especially not going to be even surface. And you're having to haul this 130-pound thing around, right? You finally get it into the receiver, and then you have to run the wiring up to your battery. So if you run it around to the back, you got to have, you know, ot gauge, maybe one gauge wire, positive and negative, on hand that you can connect up to your battery, and then you got to run it up to your battery, you know, under the hood, or if you got a battery in the back, good for you, I guess. Then you got a battery in the back taking up space. Then you got to have that whole setup. Okay, now you've rigged up your winch. Now you have to also consider the fact that your trailer hitch really wasn't made to do that. Trailer hitches are made to straight pull stuff that you're towing on a road. You know, so they have a pretty significant hefty, I guess, rating in terms of what they can pull. Mm-hmm. And don't look at all trailer hitches uh, as being equal. Not all are equal by any means. You know, if you've got a little trailer hitch on the back of your, like, hatchback, it's probably not rated the same as the trailer hitch on the back of an F-250. But they're not really intended to be having huge side loads on them you're going to be putting a pretty big stress on the hitch itself and also the frame that it's mounted to. They're not really, you know, designed to be, I guess really that's the big thing is they're not designed to be doing a whole lot else than pulling something straight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the rating on them might not even be as much as the rating on your winch and it might not be anywhere near as much force as you need to get out of the ditch that you're in. So that's kind of, that's my issue with it. So after all that kind of messing around, and then and you don't want to drive around with it attached to your hitch either. Like you don't no. want to, there are people who do it, and you can even argue, hey, in the wintertime, it actually adds more weight to the rear of my truck, which can help give me a little bit more rear wheel traction. I get that, because I did this. But, okay, if you're driving, let's say you got a Tacoma. I love to pick on Tacomas, because they got little spaghetti frames, and uh, little C-channel frames. They're not, like, they're known for being a little bendy. But hey, Tacoma's very off-road capable truck. If you have this big old weight suspended out like a lever out there, and it's attached to your trailer hitch that really wasn't intended for all that weight, and you don't even necessarily know off the top of your head the tongue weight capacity on your trailer hitch, which I don't think is huge on the Tacomas because they really don't have a great towing capacity in general. But you might, when you're hitting bumps and stuff, and all that weight is kind of slamming down like a lever, you could potentially cause damage to your frame over time, or mm-hmm. at least the trailer hitch itself. So, you know, there's all that. Of course, I didn't even bring up the fact, like, you're relying on a trailer hitch pin as your one means of, like, holding the winch in the car, too, when you're actually winching with it. So there's a lot going on with that. Uh, you reduce your departure angle. Because you got a big thing sticking out the back if right. you leave it out the back. If you don't leave it out the back, you got a big 130-pound annoying thing in your truck bed that's, you know, hopefully secured somehow or else it's going to be banging around ruining everything when you're driving. Uh, I just don't love it. Hmm. I don't love it. You haven't talked me out of it. Have I not? <laughs> not entirely. <laughs> really? Mark, I mean, you I... don't... What? So, okay, I, like I've I just said, been in a couple situations where it would have been nice to... To have. Was your trailer, uh, was your receiver readily available and easy to stick yes. a thing that's about, I don't know, two and a half, three yes. feet long right into the back of the truck? Yeah. Okay, so it wasn't buried. wasn't buried. So that's good. What were you going to winch to? And how much force were you going to be putting? That's not important. How much force were you going to be putting on your trailer hitch that wasn't intended for that force to be put on? That I don't if know. If you were down like this, okay, right? And yeah. you're going to be having your winch pull you up and out. Yes. Right? So the front end's down, back end's up. Yes. Moving on. Uh, And then you're pulling, right? You're pulling your trailer receiver down. 
So effectively, you are adding tongue weight yeah, to sure. it, uh-huh. right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Not, it's not meant for that. But it wasn't going to be that much. It's what just if your needed, tongue weight? I just needed just a little, you know, just a little. Uh, what if the rating on bump? What if know? the rating for tongue weight is five hundred to a thousand pounds, and you're trying to pull a forty five hundred five thousand pound truck out? That's also, by the way, being assisted by gravity and friction and mud and all this other stuff, and you're pulling out that way. I just don't. I don't know. I, I don't like it though. I really don't. And then you have to run, like I said, then you have to run all that freaking wire up to your battery. You Got to have your hood popped up enough that you, it's just, it's a mess. You right. hate fiddling around with stuff. You're going to hate fiddling around with that. Trust me. All right. Fair enough. Well, and I've got a lot of stuff that I do, need to do before I even get to that point. Like, yeah. that's definitely not step one. We're, we're an hour in and we've covered like three things, Jim, and we've got like 40 things. Here. There's a lot of stuff on the table here. Uh, obviously... Like, I've got, I carry a ton of tools around with me because I like to be able to fix stuff. That's also, like I said, part of recovery. I think recovery is oftentimes recovering from something being broken. Um, golly, and speaking of breaking things, like, you're so, mu- you're so much like more likely to break stuff when you're in a recovery situation. You know what I mean? Right. Like, you're just, you're putting a lot of shock on things oftentimes. So, like, especially if you're not doing it right, you know? Um and and when you're off off roading in general puts a puts a lot of stress on things like you don't want to be having I don't know let's say uh, when you get sometimes in off road situations you'll get one wheel off the ground right and it's like up in the air and you're spinning it because it's getting it it's the path of least resistance but then all of a sudden your car slams back down on that wheel because the and weight transfer catches catches you could snap a CV if you you know if you got that like you can break all kinds of things now my toolkit that I carry around is not capable of probably just like repairing a CV it could maybe help me replace a CV but that would be a big job. And I better have my jack. I don't actually have my uh, scissor jack here. A lot that's, of times, that's one thing I was going to ask. Actually, a jack. Like, what jack outside of the one that comes with your vehicle, which I always find to be just, it's never in the right place. You think it's in a great place because it's tucked away and not in your way when you don't need yeah. it. But then when you do need it, everything's piled it's on top buried. of it. So, do you carry a different jack in like the bed of your truck, or I do. I carry another scissor jack because I like scissor jacks because frequently I'm helping other people as well. Mm-hmm. And those types of jacks are really easy to slip under any car. So if it's a car that's low to the ground, okay. if it's a car that's a car that's a little high off the ground, you know, I can I can put a block on top. I can do something like that. Um they work. They're proven, right? So there are better jacks, of course. Uh you know, I mean certainly any jack you use in a garage is way better. But then you're in a nice garage with a nice smooth concrete floor and all that good stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, bottle jacks are great too. I would probably prefer to use a bottle jack over a scissor jack, but you're never going to stuff that under a sedan or even most wagons or most, most crossovers heck. Um, you know, cause the bottle jack just, even when it's in its fully receded or whatever position is still kind of tall. Um, certainly if you get a bottle jack that's capable of lifting up your truck, it's going to be too big for those. But yeah, I like having a jack. I don't, carry a high lift jack like if I'm going off road I think they're cool I love the way they look strapped to the side of an old jeep or whatever or on the hood even of an old jeep but those things are a death trap <laughs> and it's really cool like you can even winch yourself out with a high lift but you know I don't like some of those hand winching things because then you are required to be standing right in the middle of all of the stored energy and I, I don't like being right there um, then of Fair course enough, it's like, okay. I was asking, I was like, what about a come along Jim? And you're like, eh, no, I hate come alongs, dude. Those things are a death trap. Like, again, you're just, you're standing right in the middle of all the stored energy. And really most come alongs aren't made to hold that kind of weight and do that, exert that kind of force. Some they make for off-road use, but I, yeah, I just don't like being in the middle of that. Plus they're gigantic. They're heavy as heck. And they're just a, it's just a burden. Anyway, but um, high lift jacks, I also don't like using, I don't like the idea of using them to like, I know they're kind of made to be able to jack your car up off the ground so you can sort of change the grip that's underneath that particular given tire. Like you could jack up a, a, a side or a corner that's slipping and you could pack it with like a bunch of nice dry rocks and stuff like that and then that would help you. I mean, I could even see like if you were, which I would actually have been thinking about um, getting and carrying a uh, like like just like a battery operated like I love gas powered chainsaws but probably for just you know EDC yeah. of my truck get like a battery operated one 
Um, but I could see, you know, like cutting down some dead wood or something, shoving that underneath there. Yeah, you make your cream. own go tread. Right. Basically. Yeah. yeah. Uh, or or you raise up the ground enough to get to that wheel that maybe was, you know, in the air, which I guess if it was in the air, you know, but still, if it was in the air, then at least putting a high lift jack on it will keep it from falling back on you and killing you. Yeah. But even still, high lift jacks themselves want to kill you because, you know, if you don't operate them right, you can get your, you know, some body part in the middle of that lever that's got a lot of stored energy in it and it's ready to jump up and cut your finger off or slam your head pretty hard. Uh, and, you know, they're they're kind of unsteady. You can get little bases for them, but then you gotta you got to be carrying around all this extra stuff. Again, you get little bases for them that give them a wider uh, footprint on the ground so they're not so unsteady, but still, like, I just don't like them. I love that. them. I love that they exist, and there's there's certain very distinct situations where they may be useful in, but like so often I just think they're big, they're heavy, they take up a lot of space, and most of the time, like 90% of the time, they're very dangerous. Know how to use it if you're going to... Yeah, use don't use else. it for changing a tire. I don't think that's a good idea, but all the all people do it all the time. Um, I love having... I've, okay, so I've got... Shout out to DJ... Over at North American Rescue. This isn't where I normally put it, DJ, uh, even though that was pretty easily accessible. This is uh, my tourniquet general. It's actually from North American Rescue. It's got some basic you know, wound packing, but most importantly for me, a tourniquet. Uh, I've got... I always keep a socket set. Always. So many things get put on with sockets. And you know what I hate? Don't go buy a socket set. That's one of the ones you get at the hardware store that's called a mechanic socket set that comes with metric and SAE bits because you're wasting your money. You're wasting space. Almost everything nowadays is metric. That's my opinion. And I think it's pretty much fact. Almost everything is metric. Even American cars. They have all metric fasteners. Okay, so, let me ask you this, though. Like, Okay, I'm not coming up with a, for instance, if you were doing something that wasn't on your car. That you might need. To Most things are metric. Okay. I just fine. Or it's inconsequential enough that you can move the SAE fastener with a metric bit. You know, like it's not on there with like a tremendous amount of weight. And you can get it close enough to at least loosen something or tighten something good enough to go. I've got a, this I got off Amazon. It wasn't that bad. I think it was a little, probably over $100, but this is a metric only kit. And the best part about this is it's a 3 8 inch ratchet and it goes up to 24 millimeter. So that's. That's a big bit, and you can use that for a lot of different things. A 3 8 inch ratchet you can use for most things. Like, maybe you're not going to pull an axle nut off of it, off with it. But that's why I carry a breaker bar and also a step-down bit from half-inch to 3 8 so I can use my half-inch breaker bar on 3 8 bit. That out. It's down in the bottom. Oh, okay. Uh, I have a bunch of cold weather gear, too, because inevitably hey, you you're going to get stuck in cold weather. So, yeah, we were talking about that. Uh, good set of gloves, maybe a beanie. Yeah, you know, heck, maybe you know, I don't know, light jacket. I don't, but sometimes you get stuck or you need to do something, and you might just be in your work clothes, going yeah, going to work, and all of a sudden you're like, oh great, I'm in a ditch, neat, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've got I've got pry bars. I've got, even got a little uh, half inch impact wrench here for you know if you got to take off a wheel, it's so much easier to do it with an impact wrench. Just get the job done quick. Um, I've got a hammer, you know, I've just got stuff that my most commonly used tools, which I've gotten to, you know, figure out what that is over a number of years of working on vehicles, most commonly used tools, tools, pardon me, I keep in here. Um, I've got Allen wrenches of every variety, including Torx. Uh, you know, I've got adjustable wrenches. I've got regular set of metric wrenches that are, you know, closed on one end and then and then crescent on the other. I made sure to complete my kit by going up to 22 millimeters on the uh, on the wrench. A couple oh, yeah. extras. Wait a minute. No, these are the extras. I that was supposed to be a 21 mil. They sent me the wrong one. I just put that in the other day. I just actually um, put together another one of these kits. So this is a this is a newer kit I put together. I've got a set of shears in there. I do. You never know when you might need to cut something. Like what? I don't know. I cut stuff all the time, Mark. <laughs> what's this? What's this thing here? That's one of the coolest things that I've got in here. This is a fire extinguisher. Okay, I, like I touched it, and then it looked like it might go off, so then I quit touching it. Uh, these Element fire extinguishers—they use them in race cars now because they're so lightweight. But uh, this particular one gets you 50 seconds of fire extinguishing in uh, something that's no bigger than a road flare, which I do also carry road flares.
That is cool. They make one that's just as big, if not maybe like barely bigger, that gives you 100 seconds of fire extinguishing. And it's very impressive. Yeah. Um, I carry a little uh, extendo magnet too, because inevitably when you're not in your nice garage and with a nice clean floor underneath you where you can easily find bolts that you drop, you will drop one and then you'll want to have a little magnet to fish around and find it. Fish around and find out. Fish around no, and find me, out. Excuse me, fish around and find it. That's right. Um, okay. What's in the what's in the big red case at the bottom? Big red case at the bottom, that's either the road flares or the yeah, that's the road flares. Okay. I got screwdrivers of all different varieties and types in here, flathead Phillips. I've got uh, a tape measure just that's for other, that's not for an emergency thing. That's just cuz I like having a tape measure on hand. Um, you know, adjustable crescent wrench, snips, pliers. But like I said, I'm not going to rebuild a car with that kit. But that's all the tool. Those are all the tools that I always wish I had on hand whenever something goes wrong. Gotcha. Seemingly, you know, like somebody here at work is like, "Oh, hey, I've got a you know X Y Z check engine light." I do have my. Uh, oh yeah. You- usually, I have my um, OBD two code scanner in there because that's another thing that's going to leave you stranded. You get a check engine light, your car goes into limp home mode. You know, you can just check to see what it is. Um, so I like having that. Sometimes it's just knowing you're like, "Hey, I'm screwed either way," but I just want to know what it is. But sometimes you can look at it and you can be like, oh, well, it says there's a sensor fault. You know what I mean? And then you can go and you can check that and it might just be like a connection that went bad or, you know, like it could just be little things. Or you might even just need to delete a code. Like the code that went, you know why it went. and You know it's not a big deal. Depending on your vehicle, you can kind of like delete that maybe and just kind of leave it be and fix it when you get home. I don't know. Like, yeah, these are nice things. We're going to ignore that for now. We're going to ignore that. Uh, It looks like in this... Um, okay. Well, what do I want to go? What do I We're switching go? gears a lot. That's what I can. So I like these duffel bags because I like to keep everything. What the worst part is when you're going on like a hunt, right? Like or any type of adventure or drive long road trip. The worst part is when you have worried yourself to death so much about getting stuck somewhere that you packed so much crap. You didn't have it all in one spot that you have no room for anything else. So with a 24 inch kind of a you know, contractor tote bag, and then this one's an 18-inch. I could have gone with another 24-inch. I find the 24-inch size fits real nice in a truck behind the wheel well, between the wheel oh, well and the tailgate usually. Sure. Mm-hmm. I mean, measure for your own reference. But you can fit two of those, and then they're out of the way, and then you still have like basically the whole bed, you know, minus those little back corners. Right, which and is kind of like, it's, it's always a little bit of an awkward to. space anyway. It's easy to get to as soon as you open the tailgate. You know, yeah. you just pull it right back on the tailgate and get your tools. So that's where I like to keep yeah, these. Yeah, I like that because so often, like, because you aren't using something very often, yeah. you kind of put it in that spot that's completely out of the way, and then when you need it, it's like a complete pain to get to it. Exactly. So I feel like that space I never miss, and then it's also really easy to get to. So one bag I have for, like, tools, and the other bag I have for emergency items. I don't call it a recovery kit, even though a lot of the items in here are recovery stuff, but I have for emergency items. So, um, you know, I guess I have, well, I put my road flares in that one for some reason. Usually I'd have them in this one. Uh, but I keep some of my cold weather gear. I keep the bubber rope, which we'll go into. We haven't even talked about using somebody else's vehicle as recovery or using your own vehicle as recovery for someone else. I've got the ARB tire plug kit. Um, Can we open it? Oh, yeah, sure. So this is if you don't have a full-size spare or if your full-size spare is already shot or if you just want to fix the tire that you flatten so that you can re-kind of bring another tire back into the play uh, after you've already used your full-size spare. You know, this is kind of something that you should probably, you know, look up videos on. It's not the hardest thing ever to use, but essentially you're going to find the hole in your tire. You're going to kind of actually make the hole bigger but clean, and then you're going to insert one of the plugs uh, and then, you know, fill things up and you're on your way. Yeah. Then, for that reason, I also carry around this guy. I got one of those, Jim. You got the JNC? Incredibly handy. I've used that thing a ton. There's so Most many. Most recently for blowing up the kids' uh, new snow tubes that they got for Christmas. But I've blown nice. up a lot of tires with it, too. We're referring to a battery. Which I guess those kind of were tires. We're referring to a jumper box that also has an air hose or an air um, inflator on it. Not an air compressor, but an air inflator. And this thing by JNC is incredible because, like, there's so many of these things on the market now 
that you can find on Amazon for really cheap. And you're like, oh, it's a jumper box. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But you need to actually look into what that's capable of jumping. Like, can it only jump a lawnmower or can it jump your truck? Because if your truck has a 5.3 liter V8 and you got the little tiny, you know, mini jumper box, that might not happen. Especially not if it's cold, like all this other stuff. Uh, and if your truck is like dead, dead, and your battery's dead, dead, um, this thing is stout. Like when you have this thing charged up, it'll it'll start just about anything. And um, it, it is kind of big and kind of heavy, but then it also has the air inflator on it, so you could then go in after you've you know fixed a flat, and you could reinflate that tire. Uh, it's not fast by any means, but it gets the job done. And you know you could also if you do ever air down. So that's one thing I didn't go into with the traction stuck. Like sometimes if you're like traction stuck, in addition to having some of those other things I mentioned, like good tires, the lock, whatever, you can also just air down your tires. It might give you a little bit more grip on whatever surface okay, you're on. Okay, sure. But once you do that, if you air down enough to get out of the situation, you might want to air back up to be on the road. So I'd say the battery uh, on that. I was having a leaky tire for a while, Jim. That I was just neglecting uh taking in to get repaired yeah um and so you can you can inflate it a bunch of times with that before it, the battery dies. <laughs> before it goes dead <laughs> that's that's the sign of a good uh of a good thing there um this tire plug kit is cool though i'm gonna yeah made by arb so if it's trusted by australians i trust it that's the thing man look up youtube videos the best youtube videos about off-road stuff a bunch of aussies or Matt's Shout. off-road recovery from Utah. He's pretty cool, too. Um, in here, I've got an extra set of jumper cables because they didn't take up that much room, and sometimes it is... Uh, sometimes, like, that won't do the trick. Rare occasions. Pretty much the only occasion I've run into is with my 93 Ram Cummins with the big old 12-valve... 12 Cummins um that may not be enough juice if it's like dead dead and so then it's nice to be able to use someone else's truck okay to jump you um but anyway so I do keep an extra set of jumper cables in here this is a toe strap not to be con uh, confused with a snatch strap which can gonna... I say one more thing about the jump box though Jim yeah um it, and I had to use it in a scenario like this one time um it's not always conducive like you might be like well I've got jumper cables in my car so I'm good but it's not always conducive to get another vehicle oriented in such a way that you can it's a good point get or even have another vehicle there or yeah. yeah so like the ability to just plop it right in front of your vehicle totally. not with minimal space is like pretty handy absolutely I, that's what i love about those things um i've got ratchet straps ratchet straps can be nice for i mean obviously you can use ratchet straps for anything it doesn't have to be a recovery situation or an off-road situation at all in rare instances, if you need to, I've seen some people do this. I've never had to do it, but some people will like ratchet strap certain parts of their vehicle that have basically broken off, <laughs> like on, back onto the vehicle to like hobble themselves out of a situation. Um, okay, sure. But anyway, I just like having ratchet straps on hand just in case. They're not like the biggest or the craziest, but they get the job done. They keep stuff from flying all over the place, keep stuff in place. I keep a vest, like a bright orange one. Yeah. I used to have a bright yellow one. Have you ever been driving in the winter around here and there's somebody like road construction with bright yellow, neon yellow vests on and when it's really snowy, you almost don't see them? I haven't noticed that, no. I find neon yellow really hard for me to see maybe that's when it's because snowy. <laughs> maybe that's because they're wearing neon yellow. Maybe they were there, Jim. What? Well, you're like... I'm Was like, it an apparition? I'm Is like, that I didn't... Implying? No, I'm saying... <laughs> you're like, have you ever noticed that they're hard to see? And I'm like, no. But oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I just don't know what it is about neon yellow against snow. I have a harder time seeing it than orange, so I carry an orange vest. But that's that's one of those things where it's like, hey, don't get yourself killed when you're like five feet off the road and people are whizzing by at 75 miles an hour. Like, do everything and everything to make sure that they can see you. I got, you know, flashlight that I always carry. You can keep a headlamp with you. Um, all that good stuff. These are still in the packaging, which I'm embarrassed about, but that's because I just got some new ones to add to this uh, bag. Like they literally showed up yesterday, so I haven't pulled them out yet. What, These what are, are those? soft shackles. Soft shackles. Okay. Yeah. So now we're getting into talking about pulling, uh, whether it's winch related or another vehicle. And um, this is the kind that I feel like most people, kind of situation most people find themselves in. You know, like you don't have a winch. You don't have some of the, uh, you know, traction-aiding devices that we talked about, and you're like, all right, yeah, I'm going to rely on somebody else to get me out of here. And uh, otherwise, I just got hand warmers and 
yeah. key though, yeah, like so like key that. for like a lot of the stuff you need that manual dexterity. And I'm talking, mm-hmm. I, I'm this is like a do as I say, not as I do, um, because I haven't built this kit yet. Uh, but you gotta be able to use your hands, man. It's true. And and hand warmers would be they're just key this time of year. Very very true. Um, okay, so like first up, this thing, this is a, kind of an emergency, get you out of a tight spot. You don't have any other recovery points on your on the back of your vehicle. This is a block that goes into your trailer hitch receiver on the back of your truck, and then it gives you a a point for a D ring to go into. So somebody could pull you out that way. Uh, it's not something that I would rely on all the time because, like we talked about before, you're going to stress out your your trailer hitch too much. Sure. Um, a lot of times, like. I think I found this when I've pulled a number of people out of ditches around here in the wintertime. Um, like every car has some point that you can use to pull it out of somewhere. Like that, they, they, that's first off, like a recovery point is usually like required when they make it somehow. Uh, but then there's also other ways that like improv ways that you can go about attaching to a vehicle. Um, you know, i.e., you can add some on improv style really there's not a whole lot else you can add on other than one to the receiver uh, or you can start using other really strong parts of the vehicle but like almost always there's going to be some area underneath the front and underneath the rear that you can attach to if it's a pretty at least especially if it's more pedestrian style vehicle uh you don't want to rely on those because usually they're pretty small like for anything mega off-roady but definitely if it's like just off the side of the road you can rely on those pretty well just pull somebody back out of a slippery spot um, but you know, adding one on, so like, uh, like in your receiver, this is from factor 55. They make a lot of really good off-road recovery stuff, off-road recovery gear. Having a D ring that goes along with that is really important. Um, having a couple of D rings isn't a bad idea because you can just use them to, you know, anchor off to a couple of different things. You can use them to attach to various things. Um, you know, whether it's recovery points on the other vehicle or, you know, if you're really getting crazy with snatch blocks and all that other stuff I was talking about with winches. Um, it's never a bad idea. These soft shackles, though, I think are, are something that a lot of people could use a lot of. Yeah, when, when would you implement something like that? So soft shackles are basically, for those listening, it's, it's hmm, I shouldn't... Well, it says synthetic. Now, I know there's a difference between nylon and polyester in terms of uh, recovery and towing gear. I couldn't tell you exactly the, the synthetic material that's used in this. But basically, it... I'll say replaces because I can't think of another word. It replaces a D-ring. So it's a point that you can use for recovery that you can attach pretty much anywhere. That's the best part about soft shackles. Okay, so like instead of attaching it to like maybe like a sturdy metal point of your vehicle, you attach the soft shackle to the sturdy metal point of your vehicle? Um, yeah, yeah. So I'm pretty much, yeah, that's, you're getting at it. So I'm going to open up this bag. I'm going to have to anyway when I put this back in the spot. Um, so what you have here is, you know, a loop. You can hook up your winch to this. You could hook up, you know, uh, with a D ring, you could hook this toe strap. So I could use a toe strap. I could use a snatch strap. I could use the, um, bubble rope like I have over there. That's a, uh, what do they call those? Kinetic recovery rope. I could use any one of those. So I could, uh, I could hook those types of devices onto the soft shackle. I could connect the soft shackle to the vehicle that I'm trying to recover. And I could even use another soft shackle on the vehicle that's my recovery vehicle. And, you know, again, attach the other side of the uh, of the recovery rope to it. And then we just use this to, to pull, right? The thing that makes a soft shackle nice, because I'm kind of beating around the bush here a little bit. The thing that makes a soft shackle nice, so the way that they function, you open up one end of the loop. And now I can slip this through Pretty much anything. I have to be smart about what I put it through because if it's sharp, then this is going to rip when I'm in mid-recovery and then I'm going to have all that potential energy heading somewhere dangerous. But as long as there's no like super sharp edges that are going to cut this thing while it's under all that force, like I can slip this through. I've, in some cases, pulling cars up onto trailers, I've put a soft shackle around a control arm. And then I've just attached right to the control arm and I just pulled the car right up on the trailer, right? Like it was super quick. Um, You know, I didn't have to really... Not a ton of resistance. No, not a ton of resistance in that case. So I wasn't worried about this like getting shredded. You know, if I were going to do a really, really big pull, I would want something that's a little bit more probably like rounded edges and all that stuff to pull out. But something like a control arm is really strong. Usually, you know, it's at least stronger than attaching to a little bumper 
attachment point, you know, on, on the back of your car. Um, but sometimes just the hooks that different vehicles use are different sizes and shapes, and these soft shackles can slip through that, and then you bring it back around, and you connect up this ball end once again, and then you can just, you know, D-ring shackle onto it or something like you can just slip this right through the looped end on the end of a of a snatch strap, toe strap, a kinetic recovery thing. Um, you kind of have to know, you know, there's smart ways to use this and there's also not smart ways to use this. There's times where the D-ring, like if you can use a D-ring, definitely use one okay. because they're so much stronger and I'd say more reliable. Less, You're not going to just cut through a D-ring in the middle of a, of a recovery. Um, so less potentially fallible, but the flexibility of a soft shackle is really nice. I do, I do use these actually a, a fair amount. And it's way better than using, like, you know, something with just, like, an open-ended hook on the mm-hmm. end of it and just, like, hooking on to something, yeah. like, all right, let's pull you out of there. Those work all the time. I know plenty of people have pulled people out that way. But if you can have a nice, like, closed loop and you can attach it onto something, and this helps kind of keep this from getting cut, but, you know, still, it's also a soft material. Um, that's not a bad thing. No. I like those. Those seem, It's, like, kind of, not kind of, it's, like, both. Have both. Oh, yeah, I would absolutely have both. Absolutely. Um, it's kind of a hard thing to describe, so I apologize for those listening out there who aren't watching right now, and you're like, what is he talking about? You just have to look up soft shackles. And I, and I recommend looking up videos on how all this stuff works, because if you're, if you're going to get it, don't just buy it and think. It's like so many things. Don't buy it and think that you're done. you got to learn how to actually use it. Um, when, I, when I look at those, though, Jim, like they do seem they add a layer of flexibility for putting for creating like an attachment point that otherwise might prove difficult. And sometimes when you're stuck or you're pulling somebody else out that's stuck, it's like the vehicle has entered the situation at like an awkward angle. So it seems like you're like, well, you're oriented this way. So we're going to put this here and then pull you out this way maybe. Or is that, is that that accurate at all? I I mean, there's so many different scenarios. Yeah. So it's, it's nice to have the flexibility to add a point on. Yeah. Maybe that's what I'm getting. Um, yeah. And I think, I think that's what you were saying. Um, but yeah, so then if you are using another vehicle to recover with like this thing that I pulled out of here, this is a, this is a toe strap. Um, and toe straps and snatch straps are different. Toe straps, I think are made out of polyester and snatch straps, I think are made out of nylon. Don't quote me on that. I know that they're, they are made different though. And toe straps are designed not really to have stretch to them. So you, they're just basically supposed to be pretty well solid and when you you know that's great for straight line pulling freewheeling uh stuff like that on the road but the problem with a toe strap in a recovery situation if i hook this up to you know my recovery vehicle and then i hook this up the other end to the vehicle that i am trying to recover i saw a video that described that vehicle as the casualty i thought that was funny (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and then I, you know, kind of use my recovery vehicle and its momentum to get that vehicle out, right? Uh, the casualty. The problem with the toe strap is that it doesn't have give in it. And so there's going to be a really immediate, abrupt, like, snap when that finally gets tension. Now, you can kind of sort of tension it and then start to go, but you're not going to get nearly as much momentum as you would if you kind of had a little bit going into it. Like, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You had a little... Sp- when I say speed, I'm talking like a couple miles an hour going into it. You know what I mean? Right. And it's but off- sometimes that pop, you know, that's what you need. Well, yeah, but you can still get a pop with a snatch strap or a kinetic recovery rope. And that's, they just control it better. Gotcha. So a snatch strap looks a lot like a toe strap, but it's made of a different material. It's designed to have an initial uh, elasticity to it, and then it gets stiff. So when you get momentum, again, I'm talking a couple miles an hour, when you get momentum with your recovery vehicle and you get that initial hit, it's going to stretch enough to reduce the stress on the recovery vehicle and the vehicle being recovered. And you're talking more about this guy here. um, That is the kinetic recovery rope. So it operates with the same intention but differently. Okay. It does the same thing differently, essentially. Um, Snatch straps are... They are cheaper, and they're, I think, kind of a thing that's been around. I shouldn't say this. It's been around in the off-road world a longer time, but kinetic recovery ropes have been around a long time in other forms. In fact, they came out of, like, the tugboat industry. 
Oh, interesting. Which is kind of uh, peculiar, uh, kind of cool. Um, but anyway, so the idea is that you get momentum with your recovery vehicle. You kind of get that energy started, but there's an elasticity there so as not to just immediately rip the recovery point off of the vehicle being recovered, then leaving you with a bigger problem to, to figure out. Um, it also helps, I think, with the recovery vehicle because if you're getting momentum going back and there's nothing, 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 and then boom, all the energy right there, if the recovery vehicle is also on a slippery surface, mm -hmm. then chances are it or a loose surface, it may immediately dig in and it might start to get itself kind of bogged down. Whereas if you kind of get this initial like bubble gum stretch, if you will, as you're the recovery vehicle, you can maintain momentum through the energy being transferred to the recovery vehicle. And so your car doesn't get bogged down immediately and kind of brought right back into the soft surface. You can keep going. Meanwhile, the recovery rope is starting to catch up and kind of slingshot back. And in doing so, then it's finally transferring the energy to the stuck car that will get it out. And you can then kind of keep pulling on out of that. So that's what the snatch strap does and then the kinetic recovery rope. The nice thing about this, so this is... Do you keep pulling with that or do you just kind of go and then stop and let the rope do the you work? You do keep pulling, yeah. Okay. You keep pulling. Um, and because once it's once you've executed like the initial like s snatch or like hit, mm -hmm. you know, then, you know, that's hopefully the pop that they needed to get out of there. And then you're probably still going to need to keep pulling them a little bit. Okay. And that's not going to hurt the rope to keep, or the snatch trap to keep pulling them. Gotcha. A lot of people do that all the time. Now, this one's called a bubber rope. There's a lot of other different, uh, a lot of other different types of kinetic recovery ropes. Um, different brand names. You know, there may be, I don't know if certain ones are doing stuff differently, but I, I, I've heard decent stuff about the bubber rope and, and other brands too. But the cool thing about these, from what I've gathered, their lifespan is far longer than a snatch strap. Hmm. So a snatch strap, you really are kind of like they, they have a short lifespan. You might get 10 hits on one. Okay. And then they start to lose their elasticity and they start to kind of just turn into a toe strap almost. And so that's kind of a decent, it's decent then that they're cheaper because you may need to buy new ones. But also, of course, then you are potentially needing to replace one. And if you're in a really crazy wild off-road situation, you may need like 10 hits just to get one car out. And then that one's done. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. I didn't even think about that. I was like, oh, yeah, 10, 10 uses. That's a lot. But yeah, I mean, if it takes multiple hits to get a car out, then yeah, that's if they're super stuck. But I've seen people using these kinetic recovery ropes as long as they keep them you know, from scraping against rocks and stuff like that and keep them relatively healthy by being just good owners of these things. They last, you know, hundreds and hundreds of, of hits, if you will. Wow. So that's the cool thing about these. They're more expensive, though. Uh, but essentially, you know, both things are used for the, for the same idea. Now, okay. they're, not, they're not safe things either. Again, tons of stored energy in them. And... Like, anytime you're doing anything like this, you want to make sure, like, don't have spectators out like, hey, brother, I'm going to go check out this new rope you got. I'm going to see how it works. You know, and then, like, standing five feet away from the rope with thousands and thousands and thousands of But newtons. then how do you get, like, the awesome um, social clip? Oh, you'll get it. You'll get it. You'll end up all over YouTube and people will watch you when the buddy gets his head chopped off. <laughs> Uh, you know what I mean? <laughs> There'll be a graphic uh, notation there, so you'll know if you want to click on it. Right, yeah. you got to be like 18 or older or whatever. <laughs> um, so anyway, again, just not a, not a thing that you want to get into all the time uh, if you don't have to or if it's not what you're seeking to try and do. And if you do get into it, be very, very safe about it. Um, the winch weighted blanket things don't work on these, though. I watched some videos from that same YouTube show that I recommended or that YouTube channel. And he did some tests, or somebody did some tests out there. It was another Aussie. And they found that when you put those weighted, I just keep calling them weighted blankets. When you put those on these I know things, what you're talking does about. nothing. Yeah. Does nothing. Helps on a winch. Yeah. You know, and you can, you can be strategic about where you put it. But on these things, no. So I don't really understand. Yeah, I, don't, I can't figure, or in, you know. Yeah. Seems like it would do something. But no. But no. Okay. Um... But that's that's a good thing to have on hand, you know. If you if you expect that there's going to be other people around, you know, or you have another buddy with you with another rig that's capable of of being the pole rig, if you get stuck or you're capable of pulling them out, it's nice to have something like this on hand. Um, 
I started carrying this. I haven't gotten to use it yet. I started carrying because I was pulling people out left and right, and I was basically just using toe straps because the people that I was pulling out were right off the highway out here, and usually they were like a couple of feet off the road and just kind of like traction stuck. You yeah. know what I mean? So I was like, hey, yeah, I'm just going to back up at one mile an hour. We'll just boop, pull you right on out. So then I was like, oh, well, I might find somebody who's really dug in the snow. I'm going to get this thing. It's going to be <laughs> sick. And I've ne- I haven't seen anyone off the road since then. Have you been driving around on snow days, Jim, just like, prowling trying to find that person yeah my wife rolls her eyes i'm like good snow today we might have some people in a ditch <laughs> uh, but it not that hap- you're wishing that on no somebody. it hadn't happened since i got this thing um interesting yeah there's tons of like the options are like we we're talking about at the beginning easy rabbit hole to get into what if this what if this what oh if this what if this and this is for that and this is for that but i, I haven't feel touched like- on half of it i haven't because there's just but there's, like half of it that is the 80 to 90% of like I feel like you know the stuff you have here which is probably even going to be a little bit extra for a lot of folks mm-hmm. um but not really but I feel like most of the situations that most people unless you are like a dedicated off-road person right. like these are going to get you or somebody else out of a lot of jams in terms of your hunter who's going out and they're trying not to get stuck, and they're probably going to make it to a trailhead, which may have some, you know, naughty stuff on its way to it, but it's not going to be full-on Moab or anything crazy like that. We've definitely, I'd say, covered a good bit of what they need. And a lot of that, like I said, is going to be you're getting traction stuck. Mm -hmm. So you can mess with your tires, air pressure, you can just have good tires, you know, you can do a few other things, right? For the more hardcore stuff, and I know there are some hunters who go out and they get into the hardcore stuff. Mm Mm-hmm. I'd say in that case, really, the thing is just be smart about it and know what you're getting into. You're not invincible because you have four-wheel drive. Um, And, uh, you know, have somebody know where you're going, when you're going to be there, all that stuff, especially if you're not going to have cell phone service. And if you do get stuck, be patient. Like, if you're not patient with this stuff when you get stuck, because I realize you might have a spot you want to get to, you want a glass before sun down or sun up, whatever it is, but you got to be patient with this because... You know, you could find yourself, if you're in that type of stuff and you're solo recovering, I mean, you know, your winch, your winch line gets taut, right? You're, and you're outside trying to control the winch. Don't walk over the winch line. Like, don't literally step over the winch line when there's all that potential energy right between your legs. You know what I mean? Like, these are just, don't like, go. That gave me the willies just thinking right? about it. <laughs> Right? Uh, I mean, use one of those weighted blanket things. I mean, make sure that your winch line isn't all, like, basically about ready to kick the bucket. Make sure you're actually using rated D shackles. Um, You know, like, just be safe about it and be patient about it and actually come up with a plan about how you're going to do it. If your winch, you know, like, I'm assuming these people probably do have winches. Like, if your winch is getting tired out and it's not doing the job and you're just sitting still, but you're just plugging and chugging on that winch, you're probably going to burn the winch out and you have no recovery method at all. You know, consider having snatch blocks on you to reduce the load on your winch. Um, I mean, make sure the other people around you know how to wheel. If they're going to pull you out with a kinetic recovery rope, make sure they don't take up all the slack and then start to go. You want them to, like, hit the gas, get to five miles an hour, and then hit you, you know, so you get out. Of, I mean, it's just, like, so much. It's crazy. I was telling you, it's almost like getting into the really off-road crazy world and, and like this this starts to get there where you're having other people pull you out with maybe some strat method, but it's still kind of a single line, just straight pull. But like getting into the winch world and all that, that's almost like concealed carry, you know? Like really take a hard thought before you start <laughs> carrying that winch around on your front bumper, you know? Realize what, what, you are, uh, what you're getting yourself into. So you can do some cool stuff with winches. Don't get me wrong, but you can do some pretty stupid stuff with winches um, and make a lot of stuff way worse. And you spent a lot of money doing it. <laughs> <laughs> so. I uh, appreciate it, Jim. I think this is, uh, there's, there really is so much to it, but I am super pumped to build my kit um, I have a good idea of what all the initial items are, go- are going to be after chatting with you and doing some online research and things like that. And hopefully I don't need it, but I'll feel a heck of a lot better anytime I go somewhere. Yeah. I'll feel better too, Mark. Yeah. Sometimes I find myself sitting at home and it just something hits me and I'm like, 
Oh, I wonder what Mark is doing with his truck right now. I hope it's not something that'll get him stuck outside a cell reception and leave him stranded for dead. Yeah. And then it's gone like a fleeting... Maybe... Maybe he got new tires. <laughs> Maybe he did. Maybe he did. If you get once you finally get new tires, I'll feel a lot better. Like I said, that's step number one. That is step one. That is uh, that the hundred percent. So, well, awesome. Well, thanks, Jim. Uh, appreciate it. Tons of good stuff here. Um, I think this topic is like so many where there's more than one way to skin a cat. Everybody's got their method, what worked for them, you know, gear that they love. You know, there's probably people that have something. They're like, I can't believe this isn't in your kit. Oh, gosh, um, I know it. I know it. Which is okay. Like, I mean, there's lots of different opinions on this this topic as well. So, um, as we like to do, you know, what's, uh, what's in your recovery kit? Have you been carrying one? Have you been neglecting it like I have and just rolling the dice, cross my fingers? Not a good plan. Uh, and, uh, yeah, or tips, tricks, you've learned cool stuff, cool, um, I guess related things that we might want to podcast on down the road. I don't know. Yeah. Hit us up in the comments with us. I love reading that sort of stuff. Um, and you know, the biggest thing is I really, I take everything, uh, with a grain of salt, which I think everybody should. And, you know, I only appreciate, I guess I really appreciate when people bring stuff up and they actually have the science behind it. Um, now that in today's day and age with the whole science is real, whatever, I don't know, but they, I, I get, but like when people use <laughs> physics, especially in this case, we're talking about physics, you know, it's been, it's been kicking our butts since the dawn of time. Uh, when there's, you know, really cool ways of using physics to help you, you know, get somewhere better. I think that's awesome. So I love hearing about that. Awesome. Well, thanks everybody for listening. Uh, be be safe out there. Safe driving. If you get in a jam, maybe you can use some of this information to, to get yourself out. And uh, yeah, happy hunting and shooting. That's that. Thanks. Bye, everybody. There you have it, folks. Thank you very much for listening. As usual, give this video a like if you liked it. Comment something below and give us a subscribe to the Vortex Nation podcast channel. It would mean a lot to us. Also, why don't you give us a follow over on Instagram while you're at it, at Vortex Nation Podcast. We'd love to hear from you over there, and we'll keep you updated with all kinds of cool photos and videos from our adventures that we do here. Otherwise, we will see you on the next one. Thank you again. Happy hunting and shooting, everybody. Have a good one.